The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our return guest from last week's show is Sharon Milliman, who we first interviewed on NDE Radio on April 17th and again on the 24th of uh, 2017. And you can find those shows on our website by hitting the Past Shows button. Sharon is the author of A Song in the Wind, A Near-Death Experience, and since that time, she's uh, had another NDE quite different from the others. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Sharon, in fact, has had four near-death experiences. The first occurred at the age of 13 when she drowned while taking swimming lessons. In 2005, Sharon was struck by lightning while talking on a, on a cordless phone. And during that NDE, Sharon went to heaven and was greeted by her two brothers who had died as babies. She had a life review and saw and spoke with Jesus. After that conversation with Jesus, he walked her to a wooded glen where she sat with God. And they had a very lengthy conversation where much love and wisdom was imparted. Sharon's third near-death experience happened November 3rd, 2016, while she was undergoing emergency surgery, which she described in last week's show. And a fourth quite different from the others, which I'm looking forward to hearing about today. Sharon has written a book about her experiences titled A Song in the Wind, A Near-Death Experience. Sharon, welcome to NDE Radio. Hi, thank you. Oh, I hear you loud and clear. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) Good. (laughs) Sharon, it it seems you've had an intense schooling in types of NDEs, beginning with a simple out-of-body experience when you drowned, and then a trip to heaven and a conversation with God in your second NDE, to a third, which we described last, you described last week, um, where it sounds like you were watching as others, including even a beagle puppy, transition to the Golden City. And now this fourth NDE, which may answer a question many folks, including me, have wondered about. So, uh, why don't you begin by describing this fourth NDE? Okay. Um, what happened was it was on December 17th of 2017, um, this past December. Um, it happened about 8.45 in the morning, and um, I had been hospitalized for having had a seizure the day before, and they put me on a 24-hour observation. Um, um, on that morning, um, they'd given me uh, some medication, and I had an adverse reaction to it and had stopped breathing. And um, when I was in my bed, I felt my spirit rise up out of my body. And I went up through the ceiling and past the roof, and um, I was in the sky. And I kept going up further than that, and I was actually in the uni- you know the you know the universe. And but I was. I could feel myself wrapped in this cozy, it was like a black velvet blanket, and I could see myself inside of this um, cocoon-like thing, and as well as outside, and I could see the, the, um, the stars and the planets, and I felt like just like a mild amusement at seeing those things but as I was inside this it, this thick black velvet blanket it was so cozy and so warm and I felt protected and loved and I knew that there was a presence with me and although I couldn't see this presence with my eyes I could feel this presence and I had remembered that same exact feeling from my other NDE so I knew that that presence was God and but I didn't feel any fear or worry, and I saw myself kind of curled up inside of this beautiful, thick, velvet, black blanket or encasement or whatever it was. 
um, that I was curled up like a, a, in a fetal position, and it, and the feeling I felt as if I was a baby again in my mother's womb, mm. and I was kind of hung there, suspended, and I wasn't moving up or down or sideways, um, but I was just kind of held suspended, and it felt as though God was just holding me in his the palm of his hand, and I was just there waiting, and um, it since I wasn't, I had no sense of time, so I didn't know, it seemed like I was there forever, you know, but I know I was only there for a very short time, but it it felt as though I had been there forever, and um, it, it I had a sense of waiting, and I had heard, uh, I I didn't put this in my write up, but in my in the converse, I heard a conversation. I heard someone talking, and it was as though they were talking about me. Or they could have been talking to my soul. I don't know, but it was like um, I had to make a decision, or a decision was being made for me about whether it was my time to go or not. And since there were things happening in my life that um, were hard for me to go through. I felt like I was just, like, God was holding me in his hand, and he was saying, okay, your soul needs rest. You just need rest. So we're just going to hold you here, and we're not going to make any rash decisions here, you know. Um, So that was basically the conversation. But this, this beautiful black place, it... And it was as soft as velvet, and it was so comforting, and I needed that rest. I really needed that. My soul needed that rest, and and I found that rest in, in God's hands. But then, after a while, I it was like a, a like a vacuum was sucking me down and pulling me down like down, 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 back into my body. And then I could hear a lot of noise, and I I was confused, and I opened my eyes, and oh my goodness, the light was so bright, it hurt my eyes, it was so painful. I was back in my body and laying in the bed, and there were, you know, the doctor was there, and uh, there were nurses all around the room, and I saw my husband over, standing by the door, and he had this terrified look on his face. And there, I had several IVs in my arm, and I had something called a non-breather oxygen mask on my face. Mm-hmm. And um, the nurses stayed with me for quite a while monitoring my breathing. And then um, I, I really didn't know the seriousness of it until they told me I had uh, died from acute respiratory acidosis or hypoventilation was what it was called. But um, before I had that experience, I had a tremendous, you know, because of all of the people on the groups and people talking about the void, I had this fear of the void. I didn't have a fear of death, but I had a fear of going to this dark place that everybody was talking about. And when... I was actually there, it it, it was so pleasant, it was so comforting, and it was so, I was just so cocooned and protected inside of this black velvet encasement or blanket, or it felt like a blanket, and I, I wasn't afraid, there was no fear, there was no pain, there was nothing, it was just a sense of rest, deep, deep rest. And I just felt God's love and protection, and and I did, like I said, I did see the stars sparkling, and and through I could see through this blanket, and I could see, and it was like, wow, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Well, as you say, uh, many people who've uh, had what they call DNDEs or distressing NDEs have um, found themselves in a similar situation, but without the reassurance that God is holding them. They feel isolated. Uh, they don't hear the voices. They don't they don't um, necessarily even see the stars, although some do. But um, but that, as you say, it's a, it's a scary thought to be just cast out in the void without without uh, an awareness of God's love and protection. Um, but your previous NDEs gave you the insight that God does love you and that God is with you. And so you were able to enjoy the void. And uh, it may be that uh, you're back here to tell folks who've been frightened by that experience of the void that there's really nothing to be afraid of there. Well, I'm happy to tell anybody that there is no need to be afraid that God is really there holding you, and um, you're not alone. I mean, that's something that he promised, and something that he promised me. I, you, I will never leave you. I will always love you, and I'm there for you. And he's proven that over and over and over again, and especially during this NDE, because I really was afraid of the void before that happened and then it happened and it was like wow this is really nothing to be afraid of mm -hmm. there are some religions that speak of a soul sleep uh, um i think seventh day adventists are just one uh, of those religions and they believe that uh, our soul is not awake or in heaven or in conversation with relatives or any of the things that nde ears talk about until um the second coming of jesus and so that so they are envisioning uh, people who die as being in that same state that you're describing, wrapped in a warm, velvet, dark place, um, waiting. Um, and you, you mentioned a, a sense of waiting as well just now. But um, what uh, the question that I ran into over and over again as a chaplain and a question that I wondered about myself is why is it only – 10 or 20 percent of people who've died and uh, for a while, you know, had a near-death experience or should have had a near-death experience, um, re 10 or 20 percent remember visions of the other side. But what about the other 80 <laughs> percent? And I think maybe um, this is a, a partial explanation of that, too. Um, if you went from your hospital bed into a dark place where you felt wrapped and comforted, and um, and we're, we're not bothered by voices or visions of angels or, or going into the light or any of that stuff. If this was just a holding place until you could get back to your body, what would there be to remember? You know, um, so it may be that uh, some of those 80 percent don't remember anything because there's nothing tangible. They haven't had previous NDEs. They have nothing to 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 relate it to and so they just feel like nothing happened you think that's a possibility um i think it's a very dis very strong possibility um because you are it's like you are sound asleep you know and you're when you're sleeping it's dark right and especially if you're not having any dreams um your body's just asleep and it's dark, and you're resting. And that's what this was like, although I could see through the blanket. You know, I could see through this blanket. But not everybody does that. Not everybody can see through it. So you are wrapped in this beautiful black velvet um, blanket, and you are in a holding place, and you are basically sleeping, um, resting until... You either continue on the journey and, and go to heaven and go to the light, or you go back to your body. I mean, it's one of the, one or the other is going to happen, and you're going to be in that holding space until either God makes that decision or you and God together make the decision to to go back or or to go forward. So I I I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> Well, you know, I see a I see a, a real pattern uh, to 
to your series of NDEs, I can't help but think that you, um, by telling the whole story, and you probably have to write another book to do this, but uh, if you put this together, (laughs) (laughs) good. If you put this together in a way that says, okay, first there's an out of body experience, and then uh, there is a personal experience, there can be a personal experience of Jesus and of God Himself. Uh, which is what happened in your in your second NDE, and the third experience was um, pretty much watching. Uh, you were outside the city of God. You were outside the golden walls. Y- you were watching hundreds and hundreds of people stream through that garden place where you had been sitting with God. Each of them has a guiding angel, and assuming that. Everyone has that conversation that you had when, you know, in, in that NDE. Um, you know, the whole pattern, it's almost like a, 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 an updated and revised version of Plato's, um, uh, story about Ur's NDE, which he tells in, uh, in The Republic, his book, The Republic. And then the, the fourth one is with all that assurance, you felt that uh, that void, that isolation experience that I'm guessing maybe a large portion of the 80% go through. And so this is a way of telling the story of what what can happen uh, and for a lot of people maybe what does happen. So uh, I think I think the, all of those together have been a gift that you got that you can tell to to others as a as a logical progression. Of what they uh, of what you learned about NDEs. That's just my take on it. <laughs> well, I I love that take. Thank you. <laughs> um, I I was told by some other people that that um, the same thing you just said to let people know. You know the. Of course, I didn't do it in the success, and that I think it's <laughs> the most. Most people would think you go to the void first, then you see the light, then you're in heaven. And I did it kind of backwards, but that's pretty normal for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you needed that that uh, you needed that understanding of what a near death experience and a relationship with God can be before you right. could fully comprehend and articulate what the void was about. That. That's what I'm. Yeah. That's the way I see it. So I think it came in perfect. You know, it was a perfect progression in terms of educating others. And and in fact, if you had just gone into the void the first time, you might have had that same fear experience. That uh, oh, I know people, I would because I was always afraid of the dark when I was a yeah. child, terrified of the dark. And then you know, after hearing everybody talk about the void, even after having all these NDEs. I was really scared of the void, and I think that's why God put me there. <laughs> Say, hey, wait a second! It's not what, <laughs> it's not scary. You're not supposed to be scared, I, you know, because I told you I would be there, and I I am there, and so you're right. I have heard, <laughs> yeah, I have heard descriptions from people who only experienced that sense of being isolated. One man said it was like being closed in a clamshell. That this. That he was in the black and the dark, and he felt like this this thing was beginning to encase him. Now you you describe it as a velvet blanket. He described described it as you know a clam shell closing in on him. Yeah, and just the just the two verbal descriptions are a world apart, a world of di- uh, distance between them because one is terrifying, and one is very uh, loving. Well, I think it, when I wrote it up, I did call it an, an encasement at, at one point because it, it it was, you know how you wrap a baby real tight? And yes. Right after it's born, you have to keep them wrapped up real tight so they feel secure and safe. That's what this blanket was. It wasn't, I wasn't, um, and I actually felt like a baby again, you know, vulnerable and um tiny and and you know um but i felt safe because i was wrapped up tight inside this black velvet blanket and 
um, I did not feel scared or or trapped or and I I saw the when I looked out uh, through the blanket I could see the stars and it was I was amused so I had something to keep me amused but I felt more safe inside the blanket than I did outside the blanket when when I could see myself in both places both inside the blanket and outside and it was like, no, nah, put me back in the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay in there for a while. <laughs> but it, it was, I really had a sense of rest, you know, deep, deep soul rest. And I I felt like um, if I hadn't been put there, just held suspended for a while, I would have made a rash decision. I would not have come back. And that's what the com- why I I believe I was hearing either God talking to me, or God talking to someone else about me, about the decision as to whether to stay or go. And mm-hmm. it was obviously not my time to go, but I would have gone at that particular time and said, "See ya." Bye, everybody. I'm done. (laughs) And not even thought twice about it. But that's not what he wanted for me, apparently. So he was just holding me there and saying, okay, just think about it. Let's just think about it. (laughs) Right. Well, uh, in Plato's story of Ur, Ur Ur is brought back. uh, His body is brought back, placed on a funeral pyre, and they're just about to light the fire when he sits up and he says, I was sent back to tell you what happens when we die. And perhaps that's what happened to you, too. You were sent back to tell us what uh, all, all the possibilities. Um, yeah. NDEs are so personal um, and yet so universal. It's it's quite amazing. You know, if every NDE was exactly the same, there'd be no need for this show because <laughs> because you, you'd, you'd do one one show and that, that would tell the whole story. But everyone is so personal, and yet um, there's truth in each one of them that can be um, shared with other people. And I think it's a real uh, responsibility on our part to to tell people, you know, what what we saw and to the best of our ability. Um, there's one thing I wanted to say. A lot of people sure. talk about how we see what we grew up learning, or we see what we want to see, and and all that kind of stuff. Well, in my second NDE, I'm talking about, you know, it's obviously a Christian one because God is there, Jesus is there, there's angels there and and whatever. Well, I've never read the book of the Koran in my life. I have known nothing about the Islam tradition or faith. But here... During my conversation with God, I was saying, God, your hundredth name in the book of the Koran is God is everywhere, God is nowhere, and God is in me. And he said, yes, that's right. Well, I've since found out that, talking with an um, um, Islamic professor, he told me um, that there are only 99 names written in the Koran, but the hundredth name of God is never spoken, it's too holy. And so they don't speak it, and it's not written. But yet, here, I said this to God, and God said, yes, that's right. So I don't know where that came from, other than that universal knowledge or that God knowledge or divine knowledge that was given to me when I was there, that ivy bottle of knowledge. But this comes out of my mouth, and it actually shocked me when it came out of my mouth. I'm thinking, where in the world did that come from? <laughs> I don't, because I don't know anything about that tradition or faith. But yeah, he says that's right. So that kind of puts a little bit of a, um, I don't know, a kink I, in people's thoughts about it's a, it's a universal the universality of God. I think is a way of looking at that. I thought it was very interesting that now Christians consider Jesus a part of God, uh, yeah. or you know, in the in the Trinity tradition, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But Jesus, in your in your vision, 
uh, takes you to this place where you sit and talk to God. So the, and then God said to you, you know, what would you do if it's just me and you? Meaning he's the creator and you're the creation and you're representing all of, all of everything. Um, and which is, as I, as I said earlier, could be the same thing he says to everyone who co- passes through that garden, all those hundreds of people that you saw coming and going as yeah, you were I believe in your, he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in that case, uh, you know, he's talking to Muslims and he's talking to Jews and he's talking to probably even non-believers who have lived a, a loving life in, um, and so that universality was an important distinction, and that's maybe why, in your vision, Jesus took you to God, to talk to God himself. Yeah. Himself slash herself slash spirit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, people ask me about that. What does he look like? <laughs> well, um, he is the creator of all things. He can look like anything he wants to. If I was a bird... <laughs> He could have been a worm, but it just depends, <laughs> you know. Uh, he will appear to you as anything he needs to in order to get his message to you, in order to re- make a relationship with you, because that's what he really wants. So to me, right. he showed up as a as a loving man, but if he showed up as a goat with three heads, I would have took off running the other way, and there wouldn't have been a dog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I... I... I, I think it was interesting, though, that in your your third NDE, the little beagle that had died on Earth, the spirit of oh. that beagle was there to let you know that God is in everything, and God's yeah. everythingness comes back to to heaven to heaven in the end. Yeah. Do you you said you were um, a little confused when you came back from this last NDE at first because um, and that you talked to some other people and they. Did they explain, how did they explain it? What did they have to say about it? That it was a good experience and not a, not a, not, not, not a bad one. And it was because of the fear that I had that, that this God allowed me to see that it's not anything to be afraid of. It's not what, you know, a lot of people are saying it was. And also that, one other particular person who is very big in the NDE community told me that I needed to tell people the different stages of death, you know, to let people be aware that, that first of all, God is with us all the time, period, all the time. I mean, if he stopped thinking about us for one instant, we would cease to exist, not just die, but just we would no longer be. And then secondly... That there are different stages of death, you know. There is the void, the light, and heaven, and and then on after that. I mean, um, I had a physical body in both of the times that I died, and everybody Land. I saw had physical bodies. But you know, we could go on further than that, and you know, people talk about we're just energy, and energy changes form after death and mm. you know some people don't have physical bodies well i did <laughs> so this person was telling me that i need to be able to teach people so that they're they know what to expect so they're not afraid yes so I, th- I i absolutely agree um and we need to envision ourselves as bodies when we're talking here on earth because you know, if you want to use an analogy like being wrapped in a in a dark velvety blanket, I mean that's a body experience, even yeah. though it's a spiritual encounter that you're that you're trying to describe. Sharon, unfortunately, we are once again out of time. Oh, okay. Thank <laughs> tell, you so tell much our, for having me. Sure, tell our audience how they can get your book. Okay, my book is called A Song in the Wind: A Near Death Experience. And you can buy it on Amazon, Amazon Amazon.com. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon Milliman, for uh, sharing her story with us. All all four are now available on NDE Radio, all four encounters with the other side. 
So if you'd like to listen again to this or any of our past shows, uh, go to our website at nderadio.org. For more information about the work of IANS and our upcoming conference in Seattle, you should check out that website, iands.org, and tune in next Monday, Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.